I'm actually hoping Dave Cooley can help me for a second. Do you want to help me with audio real quick yeah, and make sure we're good with Illyrian? So do you need, um, are you going to make, are you going to open the thing up? Let's, yeah. Let's just do a, a test real quick and make sure Illyrian comes in clear. Illyrian, we're going to do a sound check. Do you mind just saying your ABCs maybe for a second? Test one, two, three, four, five, five, four, three, two, one. Hello, test. Amazing. Thank you. Okay, so. Milt, it's all you. Okay. And we're going without the camera. Yes? That's correct. Okay. Hi, everybody. Hello. And tonight is the very last event of the PSU Earth Week celebration. It's basically the next Saturday as to focus on the indigenous ways of and uh, so I wanted to just thank everybody who has partnered to help us in this endeavor. Uh, we have a goal to start. Uh, we have partnered with the uh, environmental group, the ESU, and the other ones have done a great deal. And they have just been wonderful. They supported us. And this morning we had a workshop and we have partnered with the indigenous groups and studies. Um, so um, tonight we have the privilege of being with the Larry and the the Anchorage and Alaska. We went to those and we uh, and we just can't walk. So uh, we're hoping that we can have a family soon to be able to support this. Um, there are many other thanks that I would like to, uh, to offer, uh, if I might. Um, in addition to the environmental club, for now, there are a number of volunteers around, and I'd like to know you take a bow. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Gwendolyn, who's been our savior, is our administrator. <laughs> Welcome. Yeah. And, uh, <laughs> board members, uh, wherever you are, stand up and take a bow. Oh. So, and also the folks at the center here. Uh, the reason I'm, I just want to go through this kind of slowly is people have been so generous, and, and I want it to be acknowledged and I want to understand that this is the moment that we want to work with. This is the moment we work with. We appreciate the generosity that flows our way to be generous in each other. Um, so, um, Quincy is taking photographs. Uh, and today's events, uh, we have a number of other volunteers who are no longer here with us today. And um, also, I want to thank Metro, who gave us a cash donation to this event. So, um, thank you, everybody. It's really good. Thank you for to see you all here. Um, So another person, of course, that we need to welcome is uh, Valerian Makulia. Valerian, are you there? There he is. Welcome. <laughs> and then I have to apologize, Valerian. We couldn't get the camera working, so you can't see all these beautiful faces out here. But uh, they're here. Thank okay. You. <laughs> um, so what we're going to do this evening is a, is a little different than most programs. We're going to have three videos uh, of the of the of what we call episodes. So the specific points that are related to the larger DVDs, videos that we have. And we're going to focus on three of the ones who are the space of the child. The second is to look at the end 
uh, intelligence of all three of the videos. And the third is a reconnection of the heart. And after each video, Larian will talk to us, comment on the videos, and then we'll have a chance to answer questions. And uh, if you can see it all here, we'll be uh, uh, responsible for so, um, without further ado, unless anybody has any questions or comments or anything, I will put it to the Oh! Would you, would you like, no? Thank you, brothers. Thank you, We don't want to take the power away from the child, so we just create space for the child to learn and to honor that space, protect that space. That's all right. That's what I do. And you know, by age six, I had the ability to not have a single thought in my head. Not a word was going through my head, and I can do that for hours. Starting at six years old. But before I did that, I was watching these hunters. You know, we would go out with five or six hunters, and we'd be waiting for the sea to ride, and the horizon was like 180 degrees. Remember all the miles, so this is like water. And pretty soon somebody would say, Oh, I got a ball. And instantly, without the person who said that, pointing, everyone in the same instant would look at the same spot on the water. Nobody's pointing. But, and then when you look, you can't see the sea line. It's still like 10 miles away. It's out of visible range. But yet, when you say looking, you know, I was watching my first week, and looking at one spot, and sure enough, after about 20 minutes and a half hours, I see my head and showed up. And I thought that was really magical, you know, as a kid. Really magical. How could they even know? And that's, nobody said, nobody twice, but yet, you know, it's the wrong spot. And sure enough, the spot, the sea line comes up. Then I also noticed something very interesting about this country. You know, I'd sit out there and wait and wait, and the flower I found by noon, you know, five years old, six years old, um, you get kind of daydreaming. And you kind of doze off sometimes, you know, like, you know, the rhythm of the water, and the smell of the fresh air, and the feel of the wind, and you just want to go. But the hunters knew they They would sit there for hours without having to say anything. And they would never get dozy. How could that be? So it's like two magical things for me at six years old. Oh, I thought I knew something was magic. But I found out how they did it just when I was six. Because one of the things that I was given that very few children have today is a freedom to roam the island and will without curfew. My obligation is specifically to make sure that I stay safe. And the adults, if I'm around in an unsafe situation, will ask me to move away from the unsafe situation. If nobody will tell me that, you know, I had no curfew, I had freedom, free reign on the whole island. And I love the fact that we had two and a half million seabirds, and underneath these cliffs, there would be tens of thousands. Can you imagine tens of thousands of birds? And I'm fascinated. I'm just like, 
you know, wow. And so I just walked out at 3 o'clock in the morning just so I could be there when the birds wake up, when the sun rises at 6 o'clock. Yeah. And I would just have to be there. They're so beautiful. They're so alive. And they had all these sounds. Can you imagine 10,000 birds, right? And there's murders, uh, thick field murders, common murders, red field common murders, flaggy uh, common murders, horny uh, chocolate common murders. And uh, we stopped at some pressed assets at full bar, and all these different murders. And so I would just run in and trip and wait for them to wake up. And when they wake up, they go around in a circle. And they kind of wait to collect other members of their species before they go forward and out the very sea. And so I sit there and they'd be like within flying within inches of me. You know? Can you imagine? They're totally oblivious to my presence. Or they will learn my presence but didn't feel like I'm a threat. That's so all. I'm watching these birds, and some of them going high and going this way, and that way, and some going left, and some going right, some going right uh, you know, and some of them going in circles, upwards, some of them are descending really fast downwards, different species, different speeds. Can you imagine the cacophony of sounds? The sounds of 10,000 birds and the leaves, yeah. Woo! That head stopped me out. I really got out of it. And, and, but then I started to think, wow, 10,000 birds and not one of them are flipping on the wing. There is this apparent chaos flying in every direction at different speeds and different heights. 10,000 birds and no one is flipping on the wing. My six-year-old body said, how could they do that? So I decided that the only way I could figure that out is I'm going to become a bird. <laughs> My six-year-old mind. Okay, I'm going to become a bird. What do birds do that I'm not doing? Birds don't think. No, no. They have intelligence, and I recognize that intelligence. They have keen intelligence, but they don't think. They're not worried about yesterday. They're not worried about where they're going to get their food tomorrow. You know, they're just there. And get them wide. And it's like, ooh, you know, the head moves like that. They're really fast. And they move fast. Have you ever watched these little birds here in Songbird? How they can move through the trees? You know, just flit it. Flit it even. They don't hit it. You do not. Yeah. Wow. What kind of intelligence is that? So I decided, okay, I'm not going to think. Yeah. I didn't hear stories about it, you know, because you're not given instruction, you're not told. I just decided on my own, tuned to the end of the whole thing. And so I actually got to that point as a child. I didn't think. And I thought that the best. And then when I went out with the hunters, I started to notice the magic happened because when I didn't think and I was just present right here, right now, I could think of the coming. Marion, thank you. Thank you so much. Would you like to comment on it first, or would you like questions first? Uh, well, I'd like to hear audience comments first before I remark. Okay. Does anyone have a question? So, if you have a question, I'm going to invite you to come on up and come around, and I'm just going to say hello. Thank you so much for being with us. And um, I don't even know really how to frame this question. But as a mother who really appreciates presence and the incredible intelligence that is inherent in that connection to nature, um, what advice or wisdom do you have for parents in Western culture who 
um, who want to support this kind of intelligence and connection to nature and uh, well frankly it's not appreciated uh, in our schools, it's not appreciated in our um, cultural perspective around what is important to foster in children. Um, I can't say that I believe that to be the value of myself or anybody present here, but the struggle of that experience is something I'm curious to just hear your reflections of. Thank you. Okay. Well, uh, first of all, I'd like to preface my remarks by saying, uh, I said the evening tastes good. That's in our language, the Ali language. And uh, this is the way we greet each other every day. And usually what you would hear in response would be, So, uh, Good. <laughs> that means um, right on. It's the alley version of right on. Uh, and, and the next thing I need to share is uh, we always say Tana Awa before we share. In. Tana Awa, the work of the land, but it's really a lot more than that. When we say it, we acknowledge our people, uh, our ancestry, uh, sacred lands from which we're from, and the Creator. Uh, so it's all encompassing. Uh, and that's usually the way that we would begin. Uh, the next thing I'd like to convey is that I'm just a messenger. Uh, the Every one of us has got the intelligence of the real human being inherent in us. Uh, we just have uh, not been able to access it because of the Western modalities that, that uh, come to play in this area. Um, but uh, in acknowledging that you are equal to me and I am equal to you, we are no more, no less. Um, that says that um, you know, what I'm sharing doesn't mean that I have more wisdom than you. It just, uh, for those of you who have forgotten, I may be saying it to activate your memory. And that's all. You know it already, what I'm going to share. Um, the Western society has a difficult time with children for many, many different reasons. Uh, one of the reasons is that uh, we are taught to teach authority and respect for authority. Uh, not personal authority, but everybody else's authority. So as a child, you listen to your parents, you listen to the adults, you listen to the teachers. You're constantly reinforcing this behavior of listening for authority to someone else. And uh, when, uh, in a traditional way, we um, uh, raise our children by creating the sacred space for them to learn, but not telling them what they're going to learn or how they're going to learn it or anything else about that. It's uh, uh, what you learn depends on your own inherent intelligence as a real human being. I'm ne I was never given any explanations uh, or, or uh, um, anything like that that explained what I was looking at. I, they left it up to me to figure it out. By doing that, 
<laughs> acknowledge that I have an inherent intelligence of a real human being, and I'm not put down. I'm not, uh, you know, uh, the implication of giving structure and explanation for things is that we're not good enough to figure it out ourselves as children. And, uh, and therefore, the adult must step in. Well, that is contrary to indigenous ways of knowing. Um, we know that given enough ex uh, experiences, uh, sh uh, shared spaces that the adults provide, that the child will learn what is necessary for him to or her to learn. Nothing more. Um, I just want to make a note of another thing. I, I notice you're writing. Uh, <laughs> in, in indigenous ways of uh, learning, we, we don't use notes. We uh, learn to trust our hearts, remember that which we need to remember, whatever it is, uh, rather than uh, listing something that someone else says that uh, may or may not be important. In fact, half of what I'm saying isn't important. Um, but given the Western mode of giving instructions, etc., we're trained to live in the head and not from our whole being, our whole being starting from our heart. The elders here say that uh, we reversed everything for living. You know, we, uh, the heart used to tell the mind what to do, and now the mind tells the heart what to do. Uh, we used to honor uh, and contemplate the mystery of death. Now we contemplate the mystery of life. You know, we, uh, we look at Science, for example, uh, takes apart things and 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 uh, minimizes them to figure out what piece they can understand, not knowing that the whole is greater than the sum of its parts. Um, this this way of thinking ingrained in us, and uh, what we're, what you're asking is, you know. Is there a way to break through that? Uh, um, well, first of all, the answer is yes. There are many, many different ways to break through it. But uh, the first step is to, is to concentrate on yourself. Are you present in the moment? Are you worried about this or that? Are you uh, uh, concerned about something that uh, received a long time ago and you're trying to ignore it now and so it's always there but never there um, that you need to observe where you're at to see whether or not in fact you are present and then whether or not you are listening to your heart or your mind uh, it's very difficult for most people in Western society uh, to distinguish between what's coming from the heart and what's coming from the mind. Uh, because we use the mind all the time. We never give it rest. This is why the experience I had as a child, um, which I, I learned how to suspend thought, is so important. Um, because it put me in touch with all the inherent intelligence of the human being that's inside of my body, including like gut feel, inner sense, intuition, heart sense, and those things are just as important, if not more important, more what we need to do. You know, our ways of, of uh, uh, subsistence in life here is 100% accurate. Um, for example, we use small boats to go out and you know, it's 16-foot uh, skiffs. 
Um, and you know, in the last hundred years, there's been no drownings of any kind, except for one person who was out there intoxicated by himself. That's how accurate our system is. And uh, it has to be accurate because our lives depend on it. Uh, our our uh, the food supply for the village depends on it. And other lives may depend on it. This is why it has to be very, very accurate. Um, this is not something that Western science can say that they're 100% accurate, but we can. Um, now, getting back to the child, and uh, after you deal with yourself, or while you're dealing with yourself, let's say, uh, take the child out to a simple natural experience and uh, find ways to take the child out to experience those things without you defining what that, that experience is, without you saying it's a beautiful day, without you saying, you know, look at that animal or anything like that, just leave it blank and leave it to the child to figure out for themselves. What they what they're experiencing now afterwards, you can debrief with the child to find out what they know. But uh, the tendency is to try to tell the child what they should experience. Uh, so that's uh, that's one way of, of uh, being home. You know, I I would at five years old, I would sit and watch the men. Uh, Five or six men, hunting sea lion. Um, we would uh, uh, the sea lions would pass by in the water. Would be on a reef somewhere, and uh, the uh, men never needed. Uh, we would have a lead hunter that would fire a shot at the animal. And within microseconds, all the other hunters would shoot because they're not thinking. If they were thinking, there would be a second or two off through that quick. Uh, you would hit the top of the back, and the animal would become wounded. So, in that sense, uh, you know, thinking. Is, is, is counterproductive. There's lots of reasons why thinking is counterproductive. <laughs> In fact, most thoughts that we think are not our own. They belong to someone else. And uh, it's a rare individual who can come to the point of um, being able to think their own thoughts. Um, you ought to check that out to see what it is that you're thinking and and uh, where that thinking really comes from. Um, yeah, I think that's enough for that one. <laughs> Does anyone else have a question? So, uh, so say just, you have to speak very loud and then you can So safety seems to be one of the big things for us and our kids in our culture here. And I noticed uh, you had the run of the island, so to say. Uh, I'm guessing there were ways that you learned how to be safe um, that maybe we could be learning more of when we work with our kids. So maybe you could speak to that a little bit. Yeah, that's a very interesting question. Uh, if you take anyone that is a stranger to the island that I was born on, Long Island, 12 miles long and 5 miles wide, it, has, uh, it had 1.8 million fur seals and 2.5 million seabirds, 1,000 reindeer, and 500 alien people. 
And uh, at age five, I was allowed to go where I wanted, day or night. In fact, I would be, uh, you know, I'd knock on somebody's door unannounced, and uh, they would always open up doors and come with you know, come in, sit down, eat. Always. And the adults always affirmed me. They never said anything negative about me, because that would interfere with development of a human being. What they would do was affirm me. So I'd be walking in the street, and every adult, every single adult from age 5 to age 13 would uh, uh, acknowledge me. They would never ignore me. And it was always affirmative acknowledgement, like, I'm a kaya, I'm a you know, good boy. And uh, can you imagine living like that year after year, day after day? Just amazing. And then to never be scolded. How many of you have never been scolded? <laughs> Okay, I've never been scolded. And again, scolding is a way of harming uh, the original human being. Uh, uh, what we do instead, like I, I stole $20 from my grandfather one time because I wanted to buy this airplane down at the store. I got the $20, I went down there, and uh, I bought the plane. And Unbeknownst to me, my aunt was right behind me, standing right behind me, and uh, she didn't say anything. She waited until I walked out of the store uh, with the plane, and then she said, in a very unaccusatory manner, uh, and I'm, I'm just paraphrasing it in English, uh, Larry, where'd you, where'd you get the money from? And, you know, I, I just said, well, you know, I stole it from my grandfather. And she said, hmm, what do you think you should do about that? So instead of thinking about putting down, she was leaving it up to me as a real human being to decide for myself what is the right thing to do. So I said, well, you know, I, I knew I was found out, and I guess uh, I should take the plane back, get the money, and tell my grandpa I stole it from him. And my aunt just said, well, okay. And so I went back, and I uh, turned the plane in, got the money back, and she took $20 out of her own pocket, gave it to me. Uh, gave me, uh, gave it to me to buy the plane, and then I went home to tell my grandfather. I told him, you know, I stole this money from him, and he said, "Boy," <laughs> what they were doing was uh, uh, rewarding the good behavior and ignoring the bad. Behavior. It's a very important thing about uh, being raised up as a real human being. Uh, the the, the um, next thing is um, uh, this society doesn't know how to raise real human beings. And we have to remember how to do that. Uh, and uh, so I was given rain uh, island myself by myself. I would walk out at six years old, twelve miles from the village to be underneath the bird cliff all by myself. There were no street lights, it's pitch black. And I would use my senses to feel the road go out to where I was going. And the rocks themselves are huge boulders that were soft rock. And they're piled up uh, uh, underneath the cliff, and there's, a, there's these large cliffs about up 300 feet high. And, you know, you could easily get hurt there. And, but I never did. Because somehow, 
this uh, accessing this um, real human beingness gave me uh, an inherent common sense. Uh, this is why I think many people say uh, uh, X, Y, or Z doesn't have any common sense. And that's what they're referring to, is they're referring to uh, a basic sense that we have that they are not practicing, that you, that you or a child is not practicing. And you before bringing a child out into a potentially dangerous situation, I would create opportunities for them to learn um, uh, safety on their own, um, with me there just to protect the space so that the person, uh, the child can learn that, that aspect of being a real human being. Um, and, and once the, the child remembers, it's automatic. Um, I have never gotten into any troubled situation on the island when I was, when I was raised up that way. <laughs> Elaine, we're going to go ahead with the next video. Okay. Do you want to tell them about what we're watching? Oh, I should, yes. <laughs> So our next video is going to be Inherent Intelligence, which is what we're still talking about. So the video compliments Dave. 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 Sorry, everyone. I'm sorry. <laughs>
because they're trying to get into the shop because if you're two seconds off, the ceiling is very quick, it starts to die and you hit the back. So when you hit the back of the ceiling, it will suffer terribly. But we have this high, high ethic that everyone wants to become an expert marksman. But more important than that, I had to tune in to whether to believe or not. I had to tune in to believe or not. Now, I'm not talking about um, subtle cues of observation because we're all looking at the same I am tuning in to feel the oldest hunter who's going to fire. And I know when he's firing. And I'm firing within microsecond. So are all the other hunters. So that the sound of five hunters is almost like one bullet. That's amazing. But to be able to feel light at that level, other sentient beings, other human beings, animals, wild. I can navigate by the time I was living in three suits to make a pod with a 16 foot skip and go 15 miles and land in an exact rock without the navigation instrument, without compass. And I used to wonder how my people could navigate with their kayaks, you know, 17 feet long. I built my own 17 feet long, 22 inches wide. But we have stories where people going down to the South Pacific, to the Hawaii Islands, to Alley Gorge, not Hawaii, uh, Southern California, up to Shaka. I mean, we even have stories that go far back about people coming up with migration from Egypt from Mongolia to Siberia to cross the coast. Not the very much that they had in the power of this thing. And then there was just never asked us to go. I don't know how to do this. Well, anyway, you know, I used to wonder, how could they travel like that when they come back? You know, what kind of navigation ability is that? Because in very see it long, we have trained in some Chinese. The rest is uh, overcast. So we can't navigate by the stars. And most of the time, we can't navigate by the sun. That's all. I learned by the time I was in that. My dad gave me the boat in order and said I was sick of the boat. I didn't have to take a policy test. He knew that I knew. That's how I would just take him on and I could feel. In my case, I could feel the energy of the world. Each part is different. My inherent intelligence, I pick up the coloration of the water. I pick up the motion and movement of the water. I pick up the smell of the water. And I can feel the energy to the point that I can distinguish between rocks and sand 30 feet to 150 feet from the bottom. Wow. What is that? This is something that an occupation of man, of course, they could call it red, white, black, and yellow. And when we start to disconnect from who we are, we lost this ability, and people have forgotten what it means. And we don't have more models anymore. Yeah. And you look at what's happening to this world right now. You know, you read in books about people who have this sense of connection like the kind I have. And it's almost romanticized, which is not good. Because if it's romanticized, then you say, oh, you're some kind of special person. You know, you were able to do this kind of stuff. And when, as soon as that label special person comes off, then you're disempowering yourself. So I have an obligation and responsibility to tell you, you all have. I'm just a messenger. Okay? I'm a special. We all are 
are special. So not one single person. If I don't want anybody to see the reality of anybody, I'd tell you about the special. Yeah. 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 Hey, Milt, was, was that, uh, can you repeat that? Could you hear that easily, yeah. the, the, the video? Yes. Yeah, it's good. Okay, well, um, <coughs> we think that we because we're in thought, we think that we are less than who we are. And from what we live in a society on like St. Paul Island, the way that I was raised, uh, shows that there's a different level of intelligence that's accessible to each of us. If we allow it to happen, we get out of the way. If we uh, stop thinking, one thing and start to uh, get to the point of being present in the moment and listening to the heart. The heart then tells you what you need to know You're about uh, problems that you have today, for example. Uh, uh, these problems are known to the heart, even if you've never heard of them before. The heart knows it. And it knows what you must do. If you listen to your heart, you will never go wrong. If you listen to your brain, which is what most people do, uh, nine times out of ten, maybe more, they're wrong. And you're guided in the wrong direction. You're not uh, beating yourself. Um, <clears throat> the fact that. Uh, I could navigate in thick fog without the aid of any navigation instrument uh, is testament to uh, our inherent abilities. I could I could uh, do everything that I said on that on that uh, video. Um, we don't talk about anything that we, we don't uh, are actually doing ourselves, um, and that's the way we do it. Um, I'm wondering, you know, um, to access the intelligence, how many of you feel like you're at that point that you can access the full intelligence? Of you? Anyone? Yeah. That's the, the sad state of affairs that we're in in all places of the world. There are pockets of people who who know, practice, and live it, but for the most part, we have forgotten how, how it is. That essence of being a human being is what allows us to connect with creation. Uh, this is what allows us to talk to the trees, uh, allows us to talk to water, allows us to way communication street talking is not work. but because you're coming from the heart it it, uh, it happened and this is where we need to go we've got to get to that point the time is now the time for um, you know we're, we're we are the guru we're the we are the master, all of us here. We're, we're uh, you know, blazing the trail for the new times to come. And um, when we follow our, our inner heart, 
we're going to be doing things that we never did before. It takes courage to do it, but, it's, uh, but it has to be done in the time, according to all the world's elders, virtually, is now. The time for us to read books and listen to lectures, etc., etc., has passed. We have to take responsibility because um, we are pushing others, life support systems to the very edge, to the point that it endangers uh, animals, uh, uh, human beings. The Earth, Mother Earth, has lived for billions of years, trying to live for billions of years more. The question is whether or not we will be the ones around to enjoy the life on this planet. Thank you. Um, I think that leads right into the next video, the last video, which is Reconnection of the Heart.
shame, remorse, anger, rage, jealousy, envy, putting me into the past. Or I'm having fear of projecting into the future, but I'm not here anymore. I am not here in this moment. I am not here. Even today, because this is a legacy of the spiritual simple path back from generation to generation, that we all have. So, 46,000 years ago, a great masculine imbalance occurred. The world's spiritual leaders communicating by the internet, not the internet, communicating with each other, knew this time was coming, and decided to hide the sacred teachings, which had a feminine foundation, it came from the womb in the center of the universe, as we call it. And we've also found the sacredness of women and why women are sacred. And I'm going to share that with you. And so the spiritual leaders decided to find the sacred teachings. And they knew that all things feminine were going to be smashed in horrific ways. High priestless cultures, godless cultures, women, Mother Earth based cultures. Mother Earth, we are still in this time in Master and Battle. All things in them are being desecrated. Women, who can't believe God, which is saying what? And you as women who are born from your mother, who have lineage of pain and suffering that has gone for thousands of years, that is now Interject in your bodies, downloads into the fetus directly. You are inheriting the lineage of collective consciousness of women and the lineage of your own ancestry. Be born as a woman, and then you come into this world of great masculine imbalance and suffering your own life experience. And we're all completely men and women. The North has unfolded and what is continuing to unfold. Women and men are being called to restore their own center of power. Because even with all of this violence that has been done to women for thousands of years, you still hold the sacredness within the mind. In the world. All these in our understanding of the ancient teachings comes from the womb of the center of the universe. And the identical womb is in every woman. That feel of sacred power from the center of the universe, which has the power of creation and creativity. What we have forgotten during the masculine imbalance is that nothing new can be created without the sacred power of the feminine coming into the center of the outer world, starting from the inner world. Right? We're talking about totally selfish and no matter what you do, I'm telling you, without without restoring the sacred feminine, nothing new will start to occur in this world. Nothing. I don't know, we can't get ourselves out of these problems. What happened in the traditional understanding of the sacred power of women, the women can take the vibration, the holy sacredness within their womb, when they work together in ceremony and put that womb out here. So that the the sacred thing is created. In the ceremonial space, for something new to be built. Then the man can stand and move the city master to create something in the other world. Question. 
run up. Hi, Larry, can you hear me? Yep, I can hear you. Okay. <laughs> what did you say? Okay. Um, I have two questions, if that's all right. Um, the first one is, do you have any insights into um, ways of connecting with the heart, um, maybe on a daily basis, maybe a, a practice in the morning, for example, that any insights you can share for um, getting into that consciousness or, or way of being? And then um, another question is, do you have insights into the, can you share any more about the, the role of sacred masculine during this time, maybe um, where you said it's the women who will be the ones to create the new, they'll be the leaders. Can you share anything about um, the role of the sacred masculine in that creation process? Thank you. Good questions. Thank you. Well, some of the ways just connected with the heart uh, may sound uh, out there, but uh, if you practice them, you will get connected with your heart. So, for example, um, meditation, but a, a, an active form of the um, Eastern meditation that's brought to the U.S. Is, works to some degree, but it's not as effective as it could be because it's not active a meditation where uh, Westerners are much more active or like to be active. And uh, so you, you meet where they're at. So active meditation, would, one form of active meditation would be you laugh for an hour. Okay? No jokes, nothing like that. You just laugh for an hour. And then you lay down. Now, you'd obviously have to do this in a, in a safe place because people might think you're nuts. Uh, but that is, uh, you will begin to experience what it's like not to have thought after doing that. Once you experience that, you know, you know uh, what can be achieved, and you work at that. Uh, so for another example, would be uh, um, crying. Crying is a meditation. Tears, you know, lets out toxins from the body. And if you cry for an hour, every day for a month now, I'm telling you, that's not like this is one thing. Do it and forget about it. It takes some discipline because you all have some work to do because your minds have been indoctrinated in the Western way. Uh, so uh, crying every day for an hour and then laying down until the the effect of it is gone. And doing that every day for a month. Um, those are, are two examples. Uh, uh, here's another one. Um, as, as, as a child, how many of you did gibberish? Raise your hand. Okay, most of you did, okay. Well, the child, uh, the inherent intelligence of a child, the elders here say uh, our guides and our teachers for how to create culture and, and have culture is to base it on the two-year-old child uh, because the two-year-old child is clear, clean, uh, energetically. Uh, when they cry, they cry in the moment. When they laugh, they laugh in the moment. You know, uh, when they're angry, they're angry in the moment. And then once it's gone, it's gone. They're, they're not experiencing it anymore. Um, I, mean, I remember I went to a conference with 2,000 people, and in the middle of the conference walks a two-year-old child, buck naked, totally unconscious, uh, subcon uh, not conscious about being naked. Um, so and then even the 
even the Bible, for those of you who follow the Bible, uh, unless you're as a child, you cannot enter the kingdom of God. As a child, you have a, um, a, a, an innocence and a wisdom that is, um, that is inherent in you. You don't even have to try to access it. And most of us have gotten to the point where uh, maybe by six years old, or sixth grade rather, we've forgotten that. And then for the rest of our lives, we've forgotten it. And now we're trying to find our way back to uh, that being. Uh, so uh, those are some of, the, some of the ways to do it is through that kind of meditation. Um, with, the with the role of the sacred masculine, it's a very important role. Men and women, male and female, cannot do without each other. Um, women cannot do this alone. And men, men, the, the new spiritual warrior's task is to protect the sacred space of women so that they can do their work. Now, that protection may come in many forms, uh, uh, meaning that you participate in, you are heading up a meeting and you decide, well, we've got to have feminine balance here. So you have equal men and equal uh, You might decide that um, uh, uh, you need ceremony before undertaking something. And so you call in the women to do that ceremony because, as I said in, the, in my CD, that um, nothing new is created without that. Now, Einstein said, we can't solve the problems with the same consciousness that created the problem. When you think about the world today, every single solution that is being proposed is coming from that place of old consciousness. Every single thing. Even the you know, Vice President Al Gore received the Nobel Prize for uh, his work in climate change. He, uh, you know, he, his team asked me to join him, and I said, "Okay, can we uh, uh, use indigenous worldviews?" And they said, "No, we've got to use PowerPoint." <laughs> uh, the, the, the thing about his message is, it's a, it has a dangerous sub. Message. That dangerous sub message is let's uh, uh, go to hybrid cars, let's uh, uh, lessen our dependence upon fuel, let's uh, create hybrid fuels and, and uh, hybrid cars, etc. etc. Simplify your own life. And that's where we've got to go, is we've got to simplify our own lives and take what we need not uh, uh, need what we take. Uh, so I hope that answers your question. Any other questions? Yeah, I have one. Hello, Larry. Hey, Hello. I wonder if you could briefly speak to the, um, the effect that uh, technology is having on our children that are um, inundated uh, w and using devices, some of them more than others, some of them a whole lot, as well as adults. Um, you know, uh, if you could talk to that about us, if that's detracting from finding, you know, our truth and staying in our hearts, or if there's a way, you know, I, d I would just ask you to speak to that. Okay, good question. Um, the technologies that are applied today without any other element informing that uh, effort to use technology is folly. It's dangerous uh, because it's, it's based on uh, masculine imbalance. There is no feminine added to it to balance it out. 
Now the elders say that uh, to, to uh, give a positive note to this, the elders say that uh, for the first time since the beginning of time, uh, we have a chance of um, having that pendulum that swing back and forth between masculine and feminine balance to stop dead in the center. In other words, to balance out the masculine and feminine. Um, you know, they also say that what we choose to focus on becomes our reality. And uh, so you ask yourself, you must ask yourself this. What are you choosing to focus on? Are you choosing to focus on that which you're trying to move away from, that is technology or whatever else? Or are you trying to uh, focus on what you're trying to move toward? Because what you choose to focus on becomes a reality. So even well-intentioned people, you look at the world today uh, in 30 years of uh, heavy environmental movements of all kinds, the, the, the life support systems of Mother Earth are still declining very fast. Why is that? It's because we are using a process that is connected to the old thoughts rather than focusing on that which they're trying to create. Even if you're trying to create something new, you must utilize uh, uh, the feminine to balance out whatever solution is going to come up. So, you know, it's really an exciting time. It's an opportunity for all of us, and it's also fraught with uh, danger. But we can't focus on the danger because that fuel, that, that pathway, if you will, it, it, it uh, will make it worse. Instead, we should just simply focus on that which we're trying to move towards. Are there any other questions? Larry, thank you so much. Um, You're welcome. I think uh, I think all of us will go home and think. Not supposed to think, but we will. <laughs> we'll we'll dwell on on this. Um, I shared with you previously when when you were here, I think three years ago, and you spoke um, some of these messages. It was uh, about a month later when a young lady from PSU came up to me and said, uh, "I wake up every morning thinking about what Larry had said. He spoke my truth, and I, I think that's an incredible tribute." And I think it's it says something for all of us. So thank you again. Um, we'll close for the evening. I want to do a couple no, things. No, no. Yeah, um, Raquel has a couple of announcements to make. We want to go ahead and thank you with a song, right? And um, just thank you so much on behalf of everyone here in Portland for your beautiful sharing and your uh, creativity being with us here tonight. Just want to go ahead and offer our attention to grandfather Rob McCaffrey and everyone on the drum. Before we, before we do that, I thought you were going to do that. Um, Thank you. Uh, so, in fact, before we do this, let me do one other thing, if I might. And I'd like to ask Sherry Davis to come up. She's a new board member. We have a gift for you prior to um, a closing song. Come on, you, Larry. Uh, we would like to present to you a mask that was made by one of our uh, local artists. And I'll just pull it out of the box here so you can see it. 
So she created this grass mask and we would like to present this to you and we'll be sending this off to you soon. And I'll have her take that there. Oh wow, that's quite a mask. Oh, yes. <laughs> that reminds me of when I visited the womb at the center of the universe for the first time. I was 16 years old, wondering how people made these kind of masks. And uh, the old man in the village me to go out uh, to the ocean and uh, center myself, get out of thought, be in my heart, and set my intention. And I used to wonder, how do you set intention without thought? And the way you do that is that you embody the intention. And so I want to know my my intention was. I want to know where these masks came from. And in the in the uh, uh, my mind's eye, uh, uh, after several hours, a uh, black dot shows up, and out of it pours a hundred masks as the as the black black dot expanded. Uh, and so I always think about that when I see masks. Mm -hmm. Very nice. Well, it was inspired by the video on masks when you thought they were lost. Ah. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. So we would like to close this evening, if we might, with a healing song, um, and uh, for you to uh, wish you well in a full recovery, and also um, I think in honor of Dean uh, Warner, when we were working yesterday, and uh, he passed out, I talked to his wife this morning, and he's doing fine. So um, thank you, and uh, this is in your honor.
Thank you. Thomas. Thank you again, Nilarian. And Thank we, you. Well, and for all of you, thank you for coming. Thank um, you, Raquel. And uh, if you if you touch on the work we do, the message we uh, send, uh, please stop by and let us know. And uh, we'll be looking at you. Going to peace. And I just wanted to let everyone know that next weekend we have our last speaking event of the season, and Dr. Bradford and Dr. Hillary Lee are going to be with us presenting with Life Force Theater, which will happen um, May 2nd and May 3rd at Game Space. Speaking um, event at the evening, and then a day long workshop the next day, and we really touch into. Um, the archetype of ecstatic movement of spirituality and healing. So, hope that you guys can take on out. And please, 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 nourish yourselves, fill your belly, and help us eat some of this food that's here. <laughs> <laughs> and thank you all so much for coming. And sign off. Thanks again. Thank you, Larry. Bye, Larry.